Amen. Amen. Uh, how many of you like roller coasters? Raise your hand. Wow, that's a small, that's a small group. I'm surprised, right? Uh, how many of you don't, would never get on a roller coaster ever? Okay, all right. How many of you are like, maybe if there was peer pressure, I might, but probably not. Okay, just Gus. All right, and Christine. Right. Uh, roller coasters are known for their ups and downs and their twists and their turns, and sometimes they're they take you right upside down. And the story that we're going to look at today is, is quite the roller coaster. And in many ways, life as a follower of Jesus is a roller coaster sometimes. Sometimes it's the clickety, 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 click, and it's nice and peaceful. And then you get to the top and it's, ah! <laughs> This summer, I went to Water Country, uh, USA in Williamsburg, Virginia. And there is a ride there called Vanish Point. And it's 75 feet in the air. Richard, how high is the ceiling? 30. So it's 75 feet in the air. And uh, my brother-in-law, who, uh, who was just up here, Joe, said, I think I want to do it. And I'm like, yeah, me, t me too. Me too. <laughs> and, and so uh, <laughs> I had all my kids there with me, my wife. And Joe was like, let's go do it. And I was like, you know what? Yeah, I'm going to do it. 75 feet in the air, a straight drop, and then the whole slide is like 400 feet because it takes that long to slow you down before you hit something. And, uh, and so there was no line. And I was sure that if I just went up there and went on it without thinking too much about it, I could do it. I'm just going to climb up there. Joe's with me. The peer pressure is going. I'm going up, and then I get up there. And when you get up there, there actually was a little bit of a line. Not a big line, maybe 15, 20 people in front of you. And so you're up there, and what they had up there while you're waiting is music playing. And here was the, what the music sounded like. Doo-doo, 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 doo-doo. It's a heartbeat. And one slide, this vantage point one that just, you sit in the slide and then just drops straight down 75 feet, is right next to another one, which actually you stand in and close the lid on you, and then you stand there like this. I didn't do this one. And you stand there like this, and then the floor drops, and you go down the slide. And so there's no way I'm doing that one. But you know what? It made a really loud noise anytime someone did, because the, dro the, the bottom drops out, so it's like, blah, blah, boom, boom. boom. So it didn't matter that there was one person in front of me. I'm just sitting there, and I've got all sorts of time to think now. <laughs> and Joe's like, you don't have to do it, man. You don't have to do it. I'm like, oh, I know, man. I ain't, I ain't, I ain't afraid to walk down there if I have to. You know, I'm not going to. He's like, and now Joe's consoling me. He's like, it's okay. You don't have to do it. I love you no matter what. And, you know, it's like these weird moments are happening. Boom, 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 boom. Oh, gosh. You know, and then, like, the lifeguards that are up there who I don't know how these people are still employed, they're just, like, making it hard on everyone. And so finally I'm, like, a couple people away, and I... I, and the thing that, that got me to get on that slide was my kids watching me down below. Because I'm like... I can't walk down while Uncle Joe, cool Uncle Joe, did the slide, but Dad didn't. And my children and my wife are sitting up the, at the bottom, you know, hundreds of feet away, 75 feet on the ground. And, and my kids, Esther, is like, Dad, you don't have to do it. <laughs> OK, thanks. I'm just, in my, it's, a, it's in your brain, it's on your brain. And so then I start thinking like, I know this is okay. Bunch of, a bunch of people, most of them which are like 10 or 15 are all going on this and they're fine. I can do it. I can do it. I'm going to do it. And the main reason that I was going to do it was because I really didn't want to look like a wuss in front of my kids and my wife. And so I get down, I stand, uh, I sit down in the thing, and the, the one lifeguard that I really like said, you know, I've got seven-year-olds to do this. You'll be okay. <laughs> so every shred of ego I might have had has already gone down the slide. <laughs> and I sit in it, and you just got to go. 
right? Those of you that have done something like that before, you just got to go, right? You got to think, you got to sit, you got to get it in your mind, but that there's a certain point where you just, you just got to go and you just got to ride the ride, right? And, and so I did. I went on the ride. My shorts stayed on me. <laughs> and, and my kids were like, yay, the best dad ever. You're awesome. That's so cool. And I was like so proud of myself. And what was interesting is I realized that the noises that were up at the top was actually a recording of what was happening in my heart afterwards for like the next two hours. Boom, 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 boom. I'm sitting there like eating a funnel cake. Boom, 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 boom. Oh. What does that have to do with anything? I just thought it was a cool story. Okay. <laughs> Acts chapter 13. We're going to ride the roller coaster of the first missionary journey, part two, as Pastor Pam showed us last week, Paul and Barnabas traveling. And as we will see, this is a roller coaster ride of, uh, of a section in Scripture. And I wonder how many times Paul was up there saying, man, I just got to do this, right? And, and when I finally got on that slide and I just did it, it was over in like a couple seconds. And, and there was so much water flying in my face that I don't even know what it was like. I was like choking and water's in my face, but I did it. I just said, I got to do this. I, and, and all sorts of motivation came into play, but you just, you just do it. And maybe you never do it again. But there are these moments of life where you just got to step out in faith and just do it, even though it might be going up and down and you don't know how it's all going to end, but you just say, God, I'm going to go where you lead. And that is the life of the Apostle Paul. Amen? Acts chapter 13, we'll start in verse uh, 13. Um, now Paul and his companions put out to sea from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia. But John left them and returned to Jerusalem. But going on to Perga, they arrived at Pisidian Antioch, and on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue. Say synagogue. 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 They went into the synagogue, and they sat down. And after reading of the law and the prophets, the synagogue officials sent to them, saying, Brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, do what? Say it. Wow. Paul stood up and motioning with his hand said, Men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. And you will see a pattern in Paul's life where he will travel from town to town and often his first stop is to go to the synagogue. The synagogue was sort of like the little hub of Jewish life, even though the Jews at this point are scattered all over different parts of the world. They're not living in Jerusalem only or in the land of Israel, the region of Palestine. And, and so the Jews in Pisidian Antioch are gathering on the Sabbath day to read, to worship, and here, the leader of the, uh, the official of the synagogue invites Paul to say, hey, do you want to say anything to the group? I mean, Paul don't miss an opportunity to preach a sermon, so he's ready to go. So Paul is invited to give a word of encouragement. And we'll see from this record, but throughout the book of Acts, and I hope you're still reading the book of Acts, read these chapters and, and become familiar with them. You will see that his custom was to go and start at the synagogue and he would join himself to the community of Jews that lived there by sharing their common story from the scriptures and then point them to Jesus being the Messiah and telling them the, the truth that Jesus, the Messiah, died and rose again. And then he would often end his sharing with an invitation for them to respond by belief in Christ and turning to him. And so you'll see time after time, Paul will do uh, this. He will... Build a bridge. He will talk to them about Jesus. And he will give them an invitation. So he'll find out where his audience is by listening, by observing, by talking. And then he will build a bridge by his actions, his words, his mannerisms, his behaviors, how he is with them. And he will build a bridge and he wants them to cross a bridge to get to Jesus. Paul isn't just there to be like, hey, you guys look nice today. The bridge that he wants them to cross over ends with Jesus. Now, here is a, a place where these people already worship the true God, Yahweh. They are devout Jews, but they don't know that Jesus is the Messiah. And at this point in history, the way to know God is not through the temple or the synagogue or the Torah or the Sabbath or circumcision. It's through faith in who? So if we're going to build a bridge from wherever people might be, we also now have to realize we need to build this bridge to take them ultimately to who? 
And so that requires an invitation. And that's what Paul does time and time again. He will say, hey, guys, I, I know the story of Israel, and he'll talk about David, and he'll talk about Solomon, and he'll talk about Abraham, he'll talk about Isaac, he'll talk about Jacob, he'll talk about the prophets. You know why? Because that group knew those things. Later in the story, we'll read that he's in a place where there are no Jews, and he doesn't name drop Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob, because they don't know what that means. We're living in a world now in our society, which is much more like that second story. You tell someone about Abraham, they go, he was my favorite president. <laughs> and so you and I need to recognize our audience and sometimes the recognizing of our audience and building a bridge takes years. Right? It's not all one-time things. Sometimes it's your neighbor and, and you're building a bridge by bringing over uh, a Christmas uh, poinsettia or a poinsettia. And, and loving them and caring for them over years. And then that's great, but hey, poinsettias die and your neighbors will too. And so they need who? Jesus, so you build those bridges, and then ultimately you invite them to respond, to cross that bridge to see who. So that's what Paul would do time and time again. He's building a bridge to Jesus, and he's inviting them to cross. And so that's what he does in this record here as you read it. Let's jump to verse 38. He tells them the story of the Old Testament in verse 38. He says this, Therefore... Let it be known to you, brethren, that through him, Jesus, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And through him, everyone who believes is freed from all things from which you could not be freed through the law of Moses. Therefore, take heed so that the things spoken of in the prophets may not come upon you. Behold, you scoffers and marvel and perish, for I am accomplishing a work in your days, a work which you will never believe, though someone should describe it to you. And as Paul and Barnabas were going out, how did the people respond? The people kept doing what? They kept begging that these things might be spoken to them the next Sabbath. Think about that. I know for us, most of our experience might be trying to talk to someone about God, and they're like, yeah, no thanks, can you just leave me alone? But Paul and Barnabas are in the synagogue and God is working so much that when he finishes his message and is getting ready to leave, the people say, can you tell us more? Oh, that's so awesome. They are begging that these things might be spoken to them the next Sabbath, verse 43. Now, when the meeting of the synagogue had broken up, many of the Jews and the God-fearing proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, were urging them to continue in the grace of God. Wow. So the synagogue is on fire for the Lord, interested in hearing this. And in verse 44, he comes back the next Sabbath, and it says that the next Sabbath, nearly the whole city assembled to hear the word of the Lord. Did you see what your Bible just said there? It said that the next Sabbath, nearly how many people? Nearly the whole city how many people were in that synagogue? I don't know. Let's say there were 50. That's pretty cool. 50 people want to hear you come back next week and tell them more about how all the scriptures work together and lead you to Christ. That's amazing. But when he comes back to that synagogue one week later, the whole city wants to hear. It caught on like wildfire. These, these uh, people over here told their neighbors, those people over there, it was this domino effect. And so the whole city gathered to hear what Paul and Barnabas had to say. Please don't let that be familiar to you. Imagine this happening in our time, that we all have a great meeting here today, and then next week, the whole city's here. Oh my gosh, seating will be a mess. That's what's happening. The whole city. But, verse 45, when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began contradicting the things spoken by Paul and were blaspheming. Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and said, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first since you repudiate it and judge yourself unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. Wow. Wow. For the Lord has commanded us, I have placed you as a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. 
And so as the whole city's gathered, when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many has been appointed to eternal life, did what? They believed. And the word of the Lord was being spread through the whole region. But the Jews incited devout women of prominence and the leading men of the city and instigated a persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. But Paul and Barnabas shook off the dust of their feet in protest against them, and they went on to Iconium. This is where we begin to see the little bit of the roller coaster ride. Paul's journeying from city to city. They get to the synagogue. They are invited to speak. That's amazing. Then the people want them to come back. That's amazing. Then when he comes back, the whole city is there, not just by chance, but they're there to hear what Paul has to say. What a moment. And as he begins to speak, now he, the Jews start to oppose him. And what started out as a potentially amazing moment, an amazing day in the history of the church where thousands could have been saved, he now has opposition. Remember last week, Pastor Pam said that there's going to be opposition to the preaching of the gospel. There are going to be people opposed to Christians, and the devil himself wants to do whatever he has to do to stop people from hearing the gospel, because if he stops them from hearing the gospel, they may not believe the gospel, and if they don't believe the gospel, they will not be saved. And so there's opposition. It comes in all sorts of ways, back then and today. And so what started out as an amazing moment now has Paul rejecting the Jews that were in opposition to him, saying, I'm going to preach to these people over here now. You missed your shot. And then he leaves the city. Man, this chapter is a roller coaster ride. Verse 52, then the disciples after being persecuted, were just so discouraged that they just said, I, I don't know if I can do it. <laughs> Is that what yours says in verse 52? After having people interrupt you in the middle of the sermon, after having the very people that were going to believe, believe have opposition and have your message and the gospel opportunity to be hijacked, so you have to leave the city. And what did Paul and Barnabas do wrong? Nothing. And they leave continually filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Even though there was tribulation and persecution, they did not grow weary. Paul keeps pushing through. Paul keeps pushing through. This man is obsessed with the gospel. This man is obsessed with bringing light to dark places. This man is obsessed with the one who has saved him from death. And so you can say, be quiet, stop it, shut up, get out of here. You're dumb and, and I don't really like you that much. And he's going to go on his way saying, blessed be the name of the Lord. And he's, he's going to go with continued joy. And Paul's going to push through. Tell your neighbor, Paul is going to push through. They've been run out of town, but they're rejoicing because God is at work and they're going to push through. And that brings them to a city called Iconium. Look at chapter 14, verse 1. In Iconium, they, Paul and Barnabas, entered the what? I mean, like, I wouldn't go back to another synagogue after all that. But what does Paul and Barnabas do? They go back to the synagogue of the Jews together, and they spoke in such a manner that large number of people believed both Jews and of Greeks. Paul's not deterred. He goes right back to doing the very same thing he did in the last city. Paul keeps pushing through. Paul keeps pushing through and he goes to the same place. He doesn't grow discouraged or weary because his circumstances weren't working out for him. There is a lesson there for us. He goes right back to where he was, and in verse 2, the Jews who disbelieved, they stirred up the minds of the Gentiles and embittered them against the brethren. Therefore, they spent a long time speaking boldly with reliance upon the Lord, who was testifying to the word of his grace, granting that signs and wonders be done by their hands. But some of the people of the city were divided, and some sided with the Jews, and some sided with the apostles. 
When an attempt was made by both the Gentiles and the Jews with their rulers to mistreat them and stone them, they became aware of it and fled to the cities of Lyconia and Lystra and Derbe and the surrounding region. And there they did what? Come on now. You see this roller coaster ride that Paul and Barnabas are on? Making their way to the city, preaching the gospel. Opposition, oh man, this ain't good. But we're back. We're back, boys. We're going back to the synagogue. We're going to preach this message. I can't help but speak the things I've seen and heard. And God is with them and God is there. And then they face opposition. And then the rumor gets around that they're going to be stoned. So they leave town because ain't nobody like rocks being thrown at their head. And so they leave. But when they leave, what do they go and keep on doing? Preaching the gospel. Man, I am nothing like these guys. Lord, increase my faith, right? Help me to have some resolve. Help me to have some reliance on, on you so that when I face opposition or obstacles, I don't get weary and quit or try to make an adjustment to try to make a new plan. And these guys keep pushing through city after city. They're just going to keep moving the gospel. And if you don't want to hear it, eh, fine. Next city, preach the gospel, speak the gospel. God works, people being healed, people being delivered, new disciples being made. We don't want to hear it anymore. What does he do? Go to the next city, do it again. This man is the energizer buddy. <laughs> you can't stop him. It's a man who loves Jesus. Then they get to Lystra, verse 8. And Lystra, a man was sitting who had no strength in his feet, lame from his mother's womb, who had never walked. And this man was listening to Paul as he spoke, who when he had fixed his gaze on him and had seen that he had faith to be made well, said with a loud voice, stand upright on your feet. And he leaped and began to do what? He began to walk. Now when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they raised their voice, saying in the Lyconian language, the gods have become like men and have come down to us. What? In this city of Lystra, Paul and Barnabas perform a miracle, and all the people in the city see this lame man walk, and they go, oh my gosh, the gods are here. The gods are here. They're Greek and Roman-minded people, and they think like maybe Hercules is here or Zeus or something like that. They see the power of God, and they think that the gods have become men and are wandering on the earth. And so in their language, the Lyconian language, they all say, let's say it together, the gods have become like men and have come down to us. Now, make a note, Paul and Barnabas don't know Lyconian. So they don't know what's happening but look what happens next. They began to call Barnabas Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. And then the priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought oxen and garland to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. To who? Paul and Barnabas. But when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of it, they tore their robes and rushed out into the crowd, crying out, saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We are also men of the same nature as you, and we preach the gospel to you that you should turn from those vain things to the living God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. In the generations gone by, he permitted all the nations to go their way, and yet he did not leave himself without witness in that he did good and gave you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your heart with food and gladness. Even saying these things, with difficulty, they restrained the crowds from offering sacrifice to them. I mean, what another twist and turn in the story of Paul's life here. He's had all sorts of rejection up until now, and now he's got over-the-top, unwelcomed response where the people are bowing down to him. Oh, Zeus, oh, oh, Hermes, you are our gods. Somebody get a bull and sacrifice it in front of this guy, pronto. I mean, awkward. The whole city has come out not to hear the message, but to worship Paul and Barnabas. And so what does Paul do? What does Barnabas do? They take note of what's going on around them. 
They assess their crowd and they build a bridge to help point them to Jesus with an invitation. And in this case, they don't quote the Old Testament at length. They tell these people who are used to worshiping statues and idols and false gods in their temples and says, guys, there is something better there is only one God, and he's the one that's made everything. This is the God we proclaim to you. But even with them preaching that, these people are on their way to worship Paul and Barnabas. Verse 19, but the Jews came from Antioch and Iconium. Those are the places they just were. And having won over the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. Again, think about the twists and turns of this story. Acceptance, rejection, worship, and now Paul gets stoned, and the people drag him out of the city because he's dead. And I don't know what moment happened where the crowds turned from like, yeah, you're our gods, to kill him. But at some point it changed and Paul gets stoned and they drag him out of the city. But look at verse 20. But when the disciples stood around him, he got up. You hear what Mona just did? That's the appropriate response, church. He just got stoned. Everybody thinks he's dead. He's probably dead. The disciples are surrounding him, and then he gets up. <laughs> what? This guy's incredible. He got up and then did what? And then he entered the city. People, hello. He just was in the city. What happened while he was there? He got stoned. They dragged him out of the city because he was dead. He gets up. He goes back to the city. Unbelievable. The next day, he went with Barnabas to Derby. I mean, I think sometimes we think, when we think about the Apostle Paul, is we think about, the standard and, and the bar of this man who we admire and who we want to emulate. And, and it just seems like such a, a far distance between where we are and where the bar of the Apostle Paul is, right? I mean, think about this. Just in this story, he keeps on preaching. He keeps on going. He keeps on traveling. He keeps on testifying. He keeps on relying on the Lord. The man is stoned. He gets back. He gets back up. He is raised from the dead, probably, goes back to the city, and then he gets back and he keeps preaching the gospel. And when you and I think about the Apostle Paul, we think, man, I'm nothing like him. And you know what? We're not. But you know why his story is in this book? It's here to inspire us to be more like him. You and I may not make the jump from, you know, Victor to the Apostle Paul this afternoon. But why would that stop us wanting to get a little closer to being like him? The lesson that we can learn from him so far with the example of Paul is that he keeps pushing through the hard times and the opposition and the difficulty. And that's a lesson we need to learn. Paul is not guided by the response that he gets. He's not guided by the crowds adoring him or hating him. He's not controlled by the anger of the mod or the, the adoration of the crowds. He's not guided by whether people like him or don't like him or are mad at him or love him. He just keeps pushing through. And we need a little bit more of the Apostle Paul in our hearts today. So don't let his bar being way up here make you just quit. Well, I'm never going to be the Apostle Paul, so, you know, what's the big, let's just watch Netflix. Come on! It's a good thing to aspire to be a little bit more like Paul this morning. You and I need a little more fortitude and determination to keep on pushing through when difficulties come. The difficulties come, but we got to keep pushing through. 
We got to be more like Paul, people. We got to be a little pushier. Paul is determined that if he has breath, he's going to be living for the one who died for him. And after this brother gets stoned and raised up again, look at the next thing he does in verse 21. After he had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. He went back to those cities where the disciples had, made, had been made, and this is what he does in verse 22. He strengthened the souls of the disciples, and he encouraged them to do what? He encouraged them to do what? To continue in the faith. He encouraged them to continue in the faith. He encouraged them to continue in the faith, and this is what he said. Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. He strengthened the souls of the disciples, encouraged them to continue in the faith, saying through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. And so I want you to think about what Paul has been through in these last two chapters. Things you and I have never and maybe probably will never experience. The ups and downs of, of this crazy life. But he meets with disciples, unnamed men and women, just like you and I. He goes back to them and he says, guys, you know what I've been through. Don't quit. You know what I just experienced? Let what I've experienced inspire you not to give up. Come on, church. Come on, disciples. You got to continue in the faith. I'm here. I came back. I, I came back from all that I've gone through. I'm not running from the, the problems. I came back to say, guys, don't quit. It's hard. It's difficult. But you could do it. You got to do it. God is for you. He loves you. The Spirit will strengthen you. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Don't, don't quit. Don't grow weary because if you hold on just long enough, in due time you're going to reap a harvest. Even though you haven't seen him and you love him in just a little while, the one who tarries, he's going to come and it's going to all be worth it in the end. Don't let your heart be troubled. Don't let it be afraid. Believe in Jesus. Believe in God. Don't quit, church. Continue in the faith. Strengthen your soul. And that's what Brother Paul is saying to the church back then. And it's what he's saying to us this morning. It's what he's saying to us this morning. The roller coaster ride that, that he went on, he's saying, guys, it might be like that for you. Let me tell you something. I've been on that big water slide drop. I know what it's like. So if I ever went back there again, I would already know what to expect. I might be worried about it. I might be nervous about it. I might not even do it. But I know what to expect now because I've experienced. And Paul, who experienced the suffering and the trial and the difficulty and the successes and the joys and the Holy Spirit and all of it is saying to you, through much tribulation, we must enter the kingdom of God. He's informing us ahead of time that there's going to be difficulties along the way. But church, through much tribulation, we must enter the kingdom of God. When the trouble comes to us, you keep pushing. Don't quit. You don't grow weary. Opposition, keep going. You get knocked down, what do you do? You get back up. You get knocked down, what do you do? You get back up. If you fall down and you, if you're walking down, you see your brother fall down, what do you do? Pull him up. You keep on walking. You keep on going. You're running into opposition, what do you do? You go around it or you go over it. The church of God cannot let trouble and tribulation and difficulty stop us. That's the pathway to get to the kingdom. And so we can no longer be surprised when difficult things come. Some of the difficulty is because we live in a fallen world. There's sickness, there's evil people, there's, there's sin all around us. Some of the difficulty will be specific opposition because of the gospel, because you love the Lord, because you're trying to move this message and raise your family and be faithful. No matter what kind of opposition is coming, you and I need to determine to keep on push through. You got to keep on pushing through. Through much tribulation, we must enter the kingdom. And there are days when it's wonderful and glorious. I was at a wedding last night, 
And I got a little glimpse for just a split second moment of what it's going to be like in the kingdom of God. Celebration, joy, rejoicing, no problems, cake. And the day before that was hard. And the day after that might be hard. And over the last two weeks, this church has gone through some difficult things. We've had family members die. We've had sickness. We've had trials. We've had broken bones. We've had demonic attack that have been coming our way. But church, you, you haven't given up. You got to keep pushing through. You might be pushing through, through sadness and difficulty and sorrow, but we keep on walking. We keep on pushing through. Through much tribulation, we must enter the kingdom of God. And whether these two weeks have been difficult, these last two years have been difficult. For some of us, our whole lives have been difficult. And nothing is going to get better tomorrow. And nothing might get better the next day. But enough days of us walking and keep pushing through tribulation, through trial, we will see the face of Jesus as he breaks through the clouds and comes to make all that is wrong with this world right. That is the kingdom. And so Paul is strengthening the disciples, saying, continue in the faith. Don't grow weary. Don't quit. Through much tribulation, we must enter the kingdom of God. So the chapter ends in verse 27. And Paul and Barnabas returned to the place they left from. And it says this, When they had arrived and gathered the church together, they began to report all the things that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. And they spent a long time with the disciples. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the example of our brother here. Help me be a little bit more like him today. Help me to not be intimidated by his example, but to be inspired by it. I pray for every family, every person here that's going through trials right now. Help us to push through. Help us to believe what you say about our situation and not what the world is telling us. Help us to believe what you say about us and not what our inner monologue is saying to us. God, remind this church this morning that they are more than conquerors in every situation. Remind this church this morning that you love them. Remind this church this morning that you're fighting for them. Remind this church this morning that even though we can't see it all the times, we believe and know that you are working all things together for good for those who love you and are called according to your purpose. So give us a fighter spirit. Give us a spirit to keep on marching, to keep on pushing, no matter what may come, God. And, and that's not who we are this morning. That's not who I am this morning. And my excitement doesn't create that. But your spirit can infuse me with the fortitude and the strength to keep pushing through. Blessed be the name of the Lord in this place and forevermore. You are good. You are faithful. You're for us. You're worthy of my life, God. You're worthy of our lives. And so we ask, God, that our lives would be a blessing and pleasing to you, and that you would help us to build bridges and show other people the greatness of who you are and your son Jesus.